We're going to t turn to that main topic for the rest of the show, and that's health insurance coverage in Florida, and especially changes to Medicaid. Again, the number to call in is 813-239-9663. If you're listening live on May 9th, also DJ at WMNF.org or text 813-433-0885. About 900,000 Floridians are at risk of losing their health insurance through Medicaid. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Medicaid coverage expanded because eligibility, eligibility requirements were loosened, but that expansion ended in April, so people might be in danger of losing their Medicaid because they're no longer eligible. So joining me right now by Zoom to talk about that is Katie Roeders-Turner, the Executive Director of Family Healthcare Foundation. Welcome back to Tuesday Cafe, Katie. Thanks so much for having me, Sean. Great to be back. I'm glad you can come on and to help our listeners through this time, especially, you know, everyone is concerned about making sure that they have health insurance. And if you're, especially if you're, if you've been on Medicaid and you might be losing that coverage, we want to explore all the options this hour. So I hope you call in and ask your questions or email us or text. So first, Katie, let's start with what is your group? What's the Family Healthcare Foundation? Thank you so much. So the Family Healthcare Foundation is a nonprofit in Tampa Bay, and we've been working for 25 years, ensuring that people have equitable access to affordable and high quality health care. And we're funded by the University of South Florida's College of Public Health Navigator Program, the Children's Board of Hillsborough County, Hillsborough County Healthcare Services, and Florida Healthy Kids Corporation to provide free, unbiased, confidential, and one on one application assistance for programs that help people find affordable health care coverage. And you mentioned a whole bunch of Hillsborough County resources there, but I'm sure that you would agree that during this discussion, we're going to talk about wherever you are in Florida, especially in the Tampa Bay area, there's lots of options in the other counties as well. Absolutely. So for Family Healthcare Foundation, we cover Hillsborough, Pasco, Pinellas, and Polk. And we're very fortunate to be a part of a very large statewide consortium of partners under the Covering Florida umbrella. So we always are able to connect people with our counterparts around the state, no matter where they are. So let's now talk about Medicaid eligibility. What happened to it during the pandemic and what is changing with it right now? So with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the federal administration instructed all states to pause Medicaid redeterminations, which was wonderful because we did not want people to lose their health insurance coverage during a global pandemic. And so that lasted for about three years. So now three years later, as the end of the public health emergency has approached, the federal administration has instructed states that it is now time to begin Medicaid redeterminations. Medicaid enrollment numbers have significantly increased during those three years. And so we have almost five and a half million people who have Medicaid coverage in the state of Florida. And states were allowed to start unenrolling people when they made those redeterminations beginning on April 1st. So how has that process been playing out? So thankfully in the state of Florida, this process will take a full 12 months. And so the reviews began on April 1st, um, but it was not everybody losing their coverage effective May 1st. It's going to take the full 12 months to redetermine everyone's Medicaid coverage. And the state's using a lot of different measures to ensure that they're getting people to stay in Medicaid if they are eligible, or they will be reaching out and asking people over the course of 12 months to either update their income documentation, verify their addresses to ensure they're still Florida residents. Um, so far, we have seen a few people who have terminated Medicaid coverage, and we're hoping to get them into other coverage options that are available for them. And we'll talk about those throughout the show. But one of the things that I, I keep seeing is that people should keep on the lookout for a letter with a yellow stripe. What does that indicate? Great question. So there's multiple ways that the Department of Children and Families will be reaching out to current Medicaid enrollees. It could be a letter with a yellow stripe uh, encouraging people to complete a renewal form or to go on to their DCF My Access account to update their information. They may receive a phone call, they may receive a text message, and or they may receive an email. All of these prompts really should solicit a response from people that an action is required. Either an application needs to be resubmitted or documentation needs to be provided to the Department of Children and Families. 
I want to remind people that we're speaking with Katie Roters Turner. She's the executive director of Family Healthcare Foundation, and we're talking about health insurance, especially about changes to Medicaid availability. I'm Sean Canan. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. We're broadcasting live from the Tampa studios of WMNF on May 9th. Who qualifies for Medicaid? What are the qualification criteria for single people or for families? How would someone know whether they're eligible for Medicaid in Florida? So Florida does remain one of the states that has not yet expanded Medicaid for adults based on income alone. So eligible Floridians for Medicaid must meet an income criteria, but then also a category. So children, pregnant women, parents or guardians or caretakers of a child, the elderly or disabled, uh, formerly foster care children below the age of 26, all of those categories may be eligible for Medicaid if they also meet income criteria. But for a single adult with low income, that alone would not have someone meet the eligibility for Medicaid criteria. So you have to have the, the income of, uh, criteria, but also one of these other categories. Correct. And I th- uh, one of the numbers that I saw is that's about $19,400 for, for an individual and $39,900 for a household of four. Does that sound about right? For Medicaid eligibility? So yeah. that actually sounds like the criteria for um, Hillsborough County Healthcare Plan eligibility. Um, and so that is one of the amazing local resources that uh, Hillsborough County residents may qualify for if they're losing Medicaid. Um, so Hillsborough County Healthcare Plan has raised their maximum allowable amount for income for the no cost Hillsborough County Healthcare Plan. Um, adults can earn up to 175% of the federal poverty level um, and get totally uh, no cost healthcare coverage. Yeah, I, saw, I apologize for messing, for confusing the two, but yeah, that was a for a, a county program. You're right. Well, it's uh, a great opportunity to speak about that resource, so that's okay. Yeah, so let's talk about what are some of the options besides Medicaid, and one of them is county health centers. Where are county health centers a great option, and uh, how can people find out about them? So in Tampa Bay, we're really fortunate. Three of the four counties that Family Health Care Foundation works in each have uh, no-cost or low-cost county-funded, uh, sponsored health care services and health care plans. So Hillsborough, Pinellas, and Polk counties all have those resources for their county residents. Um, Each of them have a really easy and uh, user-friendly websites that people can apply for themselves or learn more about those. So Hillsborough County Healthcare Plan, Pinellas County Healthcare Plan, Polk County Healthcare Plan, amazing resources. Um, Each of those have different eligibility criteria. As I mentioned, Hillsborough Counties is uh, very generous up to 175% of income earned for the household. So that will change based on the size of someone's household. Um, And then the ability to access healthcare services through each of those plans and programs is is really wonderful. In addition to that, three out of four families losing access to Medicaid coverage may qualify for $0 premium plans on the health insurance marketplace. So that may also be a resource that people are looking at if coming off of Medicaid. And I think we'll talk more about the health insurance marketplace in, in a little bit, of course, because that's uh, some, one, one of the things that we've talked about often on this on this show every year when there's open enrollment. So we'll, we'll talk about more about that in just a moment. But I want to remind people that we're speaking with Katie Roters Turner, the executive director of Family Health Care Foundation, and we're talking about changes to Medicaid availability. And so all in general questions about health insurance. So if you have a question, please give us a call 813-239. 9663. You can also email dj at wmnf.org or you can text 813-433-0885. I'm Sean Canan. I'm the host of Tuesday Cafe and we're broadcasting from the Tampa studios of WMNF. It's live on May 9th. So if you're seeing a rebroadcast or uh, if you're listening to this at a later time, you might not want to call, but you can certainly email us and we'll try to get an answer to your email question as well. So one of the other options besides Medicaid, and this is for families that have children, is Florida Kid Care. What's that and how do people find out more about that? 
So Florida Kid Care is the state of Florida, Florida's health insurance for kids. Um, there's a really wonderful website at floridakidcare.org where people can learn more about their Florida Kid Care options. Um, if families earn a little bit too much to qualify for Medicaid, there is a subsidized Florida Kid Care plan at $15 or $20 per month. Um, and then there's also a full pay plan as well. And each of these types of programs offer very low out-of-pocket costs for families, which really is wonderful given the rising cost of living currently. Um, so it provides really great coverage for kids through Florida Kid Care as well. We frequently will have families where the parents are looking at the health insurance marketplace, and then they're looking at Florida Kid Care for their children. And we're happy to walk them through either of those application options. And what is the medically needy program and how can people find out about that if they, if they might be eligible? That's a great question. And the medically needy share of cost program has not been something we've heard so much about recently because there was this expansion of people enrolled in the Medicaid. So medically needy share of cost would be where someone meets one of those categories I mentioned earlier. So pregnant women, parents or guardians of children. So they're meeting the Medicaid category, but the income for that category is too high to qualify for Medicaid. That the applicants for the Medicaid coverage um, will get Medicaid share of cost. Usually they'll get what looks like a deductible. Uh, they'll have to meet that deductible showing their medical need. And if they do, they may get Medicaid for that month to cover their costs. And we may see more people qualifying for that now as we are uh, resuming normal operations for Medicaid coverage. Our guest is Katie Roders Turner, Executive Director of Family Healthcare Foundation, and we're talking about health insurance. I'm Sean Canan with Tuesday Cafe. We're broadcasting live on May 9th from the Tampa studios of WMNF, and we're going to take a, a live call uh, in just a second. We have a question about access from D in Tampa. Hi, D. You're on the air, D. The reason why I was calling there, I was just um, flipping the radio and I have to hear the conversation. And um, the reason why I'm calling is I did receive a notice about um, renewing my Medicaid um, eligibility, and I'm on dialysis. And I received it last week, and the deadline they gave me is next week. And But I can't get no one on the phone because I do not do computers. And um, I want to know, do you have any um, updates? for um, family services that I may um, get someone on the phone. Yeah, so Dee, make sure you have a pencil handy because I'm sure that Katie is going to be able to give you a, a good telephone number that you can reach someone and have someone uh, personally help you with that question. So I'm glad you called in. So how would you respond, Katie? Thank you so much for calling in. So we would love to be able to assist you. So if you want to give us a call at 813-995-7005, we would be able to assist in helping you get your information over to the Department of Children and Families. Um, I will say that call volumes right now are high with the department with DCF, given the amount of people who are having to redetermine. Um, we are working hard to help people with assisting them by faxing their documentation, using DCF's virtual assistant to, to check on information, seeing if we can help them with their DCF access account as well. And we have seven, um, we're at multiple different locations, specifically um, in all of the counties that we serve, Hillsborough, Pasco, Pinellas, and Polk. And D, if there is a good in-person location that we can meet you at to help you with that, um, or we'll also help, you know, assist you over the phone as much as we can. Can you um, give me that number slowly, please, you in the little thing? Yes, ma'am. 813-995-7005. 995 and the last four. Sure, 7005. 7005. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for calling in, Dee, and I hope that you get your questions resolved. And thanks for calling yes. in. Thank you so much. Thanks. And if you'd like to call in, 813-239-9663. You can also email us at dj at wmnf.org or text 813-433-0885. If you have a question for our guest, Katie Roders turner Executive Director of Family Healthcare Foundation, and we're talking about medical insurance specifically about changes to Medicaid availability. 
And we are also talking about some alternatives to Medicaid. And one of them is federally qualified health centers. How can people find out about those and what services do those provide? Great. So the uh, federally qualified health care centers are a great place to receive uh, health care services. Um, in Tampa Bay, we're very fortunate to have some wonderful ones. So in uh, Hillsborough County, we have our friends at Tampa Family Health Centers or Suncoast Community Health Centers. In Pasco, there's Premier Community Health Care as well. In Pinellas County, Evra Health, Hope County, Central Florida Healthcare. So all of these centers are going to provide very low cost out of pocket services for people based on sliding scales, multiple locations, primary care and some specialty cares as well. And they will accept insurance and they will also allow for self-pay too. And I've also, now might be a good time to talk about the Affordable Care Act and the services that you provide for what some people call Obamacare uh, and, and getting through the health insurance marketplace. So remind us the history of the Affordable Care Act and what services are available and how your, how, uh, your group can help people about that when there's time for open enrollment. Thank you. So when the Affordable Care Act passed in 2010, it established the health insurance marketplace, as well as the role of navigators, certified marketplace navigators. So since 2013, the Family Healthcare Foundation has been helping Tampa Bay residents enroll on, into the health insurance marketplace plans. And that's a one-stop shop where everyone can see all of the plans available to them that meet the standards of the Affordable Healthcare, of the Affordable Healthcare, uh, Healthcare Act or qualified healthcare plans. And so they um, have to cover 10 essential health benefits, cover preventative services, and they're all available on healthcare.gov. So our navigators help people shop plans side by side, see if providers are in network, help them compare plans and you know, learn more about their options. And losing Medicaid will be a qualifying life event and people are eligible to go into healthcare.gov at that time and look at their options. And when you say qualifying life event, what what you mean what you mean is that typically during the year, there's only certain times when anybody can sign up for an Affordable Care Act nav uh, plan. But if you have something that happens in your life, like you lose your Medicaid or you change jobs or something like that, then you might be eligible again to for for enrollment. Exactly. So November first through January fifteenth is the open enrollment period. But just like you said, Sean, if someone's losing their health care coverage, that's a qualifying life event. Getting married, having a baby, changing jobs, moving. These are all reasons that someone could get a, a special enrollment period to go and look at new options on healthcare.gov. My guest is Katie Roders turner with Family Healthcare Foundation. And most of this hour, we're, we're talking about changes to Medicaid availability. So switching back right now to Medicaid availability, if people are currently enrolled in Medicaid, typically what happens is that each year they have to check to to see if they remain qualified. So that's going that hasn't been happening during the pandemic, but that's going to start happening. So if it, it just is maybe you can remind people what they can expect each year when that happens, so that it's not a surprise to them. Thank you. So for so usually every year. Medicaid enrollees are asked to reapply for benefits and, if necessary, update their eligibility documentation like income to determine if they're continuing to be eligible for Medicaid. And as you mentioned, Sean, this has kind of been paused for the most part for almost three years. So we are now resuming normal operations. And over the course of the next 12 months, all current Medicaid enrollees may need to be redetermined as eligible. State agencies are working really hard to use their own sources to decide, you know, if someone is eligible and not having to ask them to provide information, but they may have to. And if so, current Medicaid enrollees should be looking for letters with a yellow stripe that may have a renewal request or documentation request. They may receive text messages or phone calls or an email. And in addition to these yearly eligibility checks, um, it might be more frequently if people use benefits like SNAP. What's that all about? That is true. So SNAP, um, some supplement, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or sometimes called food stamps, those benefits are usually, you will have to reapply every six months. And because it is through the same portal, the DCF My Access portal, uh, sometimes benefits are redetermined more frequently than every year. 
if someone is also getting SNAP benefits. I will say that the Department of Children and Families came out with a really wonderful and comprehensive redetermination plan, and they were trying to align those dates so people weren't having to redetermine multiple times throughout this year. And I believe all efforts are helping to try, all efforts are being made to help streamline that to avoid a burden on current Medicaid enrollees. I want to remind people that our guest is Katie Roders Turner, and she is the executive director of Family Healthcare Foundation. We're talking about health insurance this hour, especially changes to Medicaid availability. And I'm Sean Canan, and this is WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. Uh, right now, we're going to listen to a, a story about oral health. And so um, afterwards, we'll talk to Katie about why oral health is important. But here is, let me set this up, the um, dental hygienists are trying to raise awareness about the importance of oral hygiene. Tramel Gomes reports that dental pain is one of the most common reasons for school absenteeism among children. Let's listen to his story. Studies show children with dental pain more likely to miss school. In addition, a child or teenager with noticeable dental disorders, such as blackened teeth or tooth loss, can take a negative toll on their self-esteem. Betty Cable sees this all too often as a dental hygienist and director of dental outreach at North Florida Medical. She says for too long, people have treated oral hygiene as a secondary issue instead of a primary concern. If a child has a broken arm, they would not be walking around with a broken arm. And your tooth, if it's an infection or it's abscess, it's broken and there's a problem. So it's not okay for a kid to be in tooth pain. Student health is among the top causes for chronic absenteeism, which includes dental pain, vision problems, or mental health. According to the Healthy Schools Campaign, Cable says there needs to be more awareness and expanded access for dental care, especially in rural areas. Cable says she hears firsthand from the children she treats who feel embarrassed and find it difficult to concentrate due to severe pain. She warns there are worse outcomes for untreated dental problems. Children die from tooth infections. I mean, the infection is right there next to their brain. It's in their bloodstream. So it's a matter of life and death when you're walking around with an infection in your mouth. Florida is among the top states in the nation with individuals living in dental health professional shortage areas. And Cable says her organization tries to fill the gaps by working with parents and caregivers to try to treat kids who end up in their school nurses' offices with severe pain. She says there are just not a lot of providers that see children, so they do their best to get kids into the ones that do provide care to kids. This is Tramel Gomes for Florida News Connection. Well, thanks to Tramel for that story and for to Florida News Connection. And that w was talking about the importance of dental health as part of a, a whole health regime. And I want to go back now to our guest, who is Katie Roders Turner, Executive Director of Family Healthcare Foundation. So, Katie, what can you say about the story we just heard and about dental health as a part of, of the whole health uh, health system, I guess? Absolutely. I think one of the amazing things about, you know, the Affordable Care Act is that they ensured that for children's health care plans, they had to include dental services as well. And so um, for, in addition to that, Florida kid care programs all include a dental option too. And then again, Hillsborough County Health Care Plan, which is for Hillsborough County residents, of course, um, now offers up to $2,500 in dental services for its members. And so there really is this sort of multi-system perspective that dental care, health care, dental care is a part of health care. It's a part of someone's body. It's a part of their overall quality of life and their uh, health outcomes. So, and is that something that the healthcare nav navigators can walk you through is dental insurance, or is that separate from, from health insurance and part of the Obamacare uh, marketplace? So for the health the health insurance plans on the health insurance marketplace there are plans that will that are required to cover especially dental for children under the age of 19 so the pediatric dental services and then in addition to that some of the plans do offer dental for adults and then any of the plans can have a dental supplemental added onto it on healthcare.gov as well so people can shop for their de uh, health insurance coverage and then add on dental too and just to remind people that when you are looking at the Affordable Care Act marketplace for health insurance, oftentimes there are navigators that can help you to work through that process. So, Katie, tell us how someone can meet with a navigator and uh, what what they do. 
Thanks so much. So in Tampa Bay, the Family Healthcare Foundation partners with Baycare Health System, Tampa General Hospital, Evra Health, and Premier Community Healthcare. We have over 35 navigators across the four counties that we serve, helping people navigate healthcare totally for free. Um, and many of our navigators have been doing this for 10 years. So we're very passionate about ensuring that everyone has access to affordable healthcare coverage that best meets their need. We're really fortunate as well to be a part of a large statewide consortium of navigators uh, through covering Florida, and that's run through the University of South Florida's College of Public Health. Locally in Tampa Bay, anyone can find a navigator via our website, familyhealthcarefdn.org, or by calling us at 813-995-7005. And then outside of Tampa Bay, uh, navigators can be found at coveringflorida.org. And if English is not your first language, there's help for you there with speaking with a navigator as well, right? Absolutely. So on our website, our website will be in English and or Spanish if needed. And then we have navigators who speak English, Spanish, Creole, Portuguese, Russian, and there's many other language options around the state of Florida as well. And a good place to start with that if you're in the Tampa Bay area is by calling that number 813-995-7005. And that they could put you in touch with whoever else you would need to speak with, right? Absolutely. Our guest is Katie Roders Turner. She's executive director of Family Healthcare Foundation, and we're talking about health insurance this hour, especially changes to Medicaid availability. If you have questions, please call us at 813-239-9663. You can also text us at 813-433-0885. And if you'd like to email, that's dj at wmnf. .org. I'm going to go now to another story we have here about healthcare. This is specifically about a, a medical um, a prescription that might not be available uh, as easily these days because of the legal process. The first one is about changes. This story there is about changes involving an important HIV medication. The Affordable Care Act requires that most private health insurance plans cover PrEP. That's a medicine that can lower the risk of getting HIV from sex by nearly 100%. But a court ruling in March might let insurers drop PrEP coverage. We're going to hear this interview between Stephen Fallon, who, who says that would especially harm non-white and lower income LGBTQ people. He's the CEO of Latinos Salud, a provider in South Florida. And Fallon spoke to reporter Veronica Zaragovia. Let's listen to this and we'll take your comments as well. 813-239-9663 or dj at wmnf.org. South Florida has the highest rates of new HIV cases in the nation. After a few days or a week of taking PrEP, you've built up essentially a wall of medications that will block the virus from getting into your body. You're supposed to take it seven days a week, if somebody gets used to being on PrEP and then they stop, their risk of acquiring HIV can actually be higher than if they never started PrEP in the first place because they carry that feeling of self-assurance that they may not have had before. So retaining patients on PrEP is vitally important. One of our wellness navigators main jobs is to reach out to people if there's any gap in their PrEP refills and say, did you mean to stop taking PrEP? If you've found a new partner and you've tested negative and you don't need PrEP anymore, good for you. But if you just fell off of it because nobody called you up to check, we want to call you up and help you get back on PrEP. We have very poor health insurance coverage rates in Florida. So many people living with HIV don't stay continuously in care, and we can't rely solely upon treating people with HIV to stop the transmission. The health care reform law from 2010, known as the Affordable Care Act or ACA, it requires that most health insurance plans cover PrEP for free. But you found at Latino Salud that patients might still get bills, right? Why is that? The rollout of the PrEP protection has been uneven and slow. It seems that insurance companies are slow walking acceptance of the rules that they have to provide access to PrEP with no cost sharing. So over the three years that our wellness clinic has been open, Veronica, we have seen patients receive bills that indicate they're supposed to share in the cost of the medication, share in the cost of the medical visit, share in the cost of the labs. 
that is not supposed to be that way. And let's talk about the Braidwood Management v. Becerra case. That's Javier Becerra, the U.S. Secretary for Health and Human Services. In this case, a federal judge in Texas ruled in March in favor of the plaintiffs who argued that some requirements like covering PrEP violates their religious rights. What are your concerns about limiting preventative services? In the Braidwood v. Becerra decision, the plaintiffs were not primarily concerned about the additional costs of including ACA-mandated services. They simply want an exemption from having to provide to their employees regular ACA health insurance because they object to certain included services. But even though their intent was about the types of services provided, the impact of the Texas judge's decision could essentially create a caste system of health insurance plans with some employers choosing insurance plans that would deny their employees access to the very free preventive or screening services that help lower overall medical costs and taxes for all of us because patients will not have access to screening for cancers as early. They'll not address hypertension when needed, and they may not be able to afford the pill that can prevent them from acquiring and possibly transmitting on HIV. If you've heard about the Braidwood decision, don't panic. Insurance companies write their policies at least a year in advance. Nothing's going to change immediately. Next thing is there will always be a market where somebody will say, I want to provide the better insurance rather than the crummy insurance. Well, that was Stephen Fallon of Latino Salud speaking with reporter Veronica Zaragovia. The federal government is still appealing the judge's decision about PrEP, so it still has to play out in the courts. And you're listening to 88.5 FM WMNF Tampa. My name is Sean Canan, and this is Tuesday Cafe, and we're talking about health insurance this hour with my guest. My guest is Katie Roders turner She's executive director of Family Healthcare Foundation. And the, what has prompted us to talk about health insurance today, of all days especially, is that... There's been changes to Medicaid availability in the last month or two, and that has to do with the end of the the medical, the pandemic, um, the, the emergency of the pandemic. And so things are kind of reverting to pre-pandemic levels with Medicaid availability, which means that kind of suddenly there's going to, there could be tens of thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands of Floridians who are no longer eligible for Medicaid. And so we're trying to look at some of the other options and how people can, can make sure that they are qualified or get qualified for Medicaid. And Katie, one of those, uh, th one of the things I wanted to ask you about is a comparison with of Florida with other states. Because as you mentioned earlier, Florida hasn't expanded Medicaid. It was given the option to do so under the Affordable Care Act. What does Florida look like when it comes to access for low-income people to health insurance compared to other states? Some of those states have uh, expanded their eligibility for Medicaid? Well, yeah, anecdotally, you know, we, we do see a lot of people moving to Florida from other states. And when we meet with those people and they're looking for health insurance coverage and they've come from states like California or New York or Colorado or many other states in the United States uh, that have expanded Medicaid, they're always very surprised if they fall into what we refer to as the Medicaid gap population, not covered by Medicaid, but not earning enough to qualify for the federal subsidies. Um, and so that's always a big, big shock to people who weren't aware of that because we are one of the few remaining states to not expand Medicaid. That's why I feel so passionately about how fortunate we are in Tampa Bay to have access to safety net programs like no cost or low cost county healthcare plans. Because for many of the 67 counties in the state of Florida, those aren't options. And so we're always very, very pleased to be able to promote those options to people who fall into that Medicaid gap. So what I hear you saying about people who are moving here is in their older states, in their previous states that had expanded Medicaid, they were covered. They were they had no problem. And here it's just kind of another layer of uh, they have to go they have to go through you probably to find out what are their other options now that they can't they don't qualify for Medicaid based on their income. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and you can call in if you want, 813-239-9663. If you have a question for healthcare 
uh, experts. If you want to ask a question about M Medicaid expansion, or I'm sorry, about Medicaid um, eligibility or about health insurance, you can also email us at dj at wmnf.org. We ran over a little bit at this, the beginning of this show about this, but uh, we can talk again in case people are joining us again. Um, why is it Why is it that me we're concerned about Medicaid enrollment possibly going down over the next 12 months in Florida? Uh, remind people what's go what's at stake here and, and why this is happening. Sure. So, uh, you know, at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, it's March 2020, the federal administration instructed all states to pause Medicaid redeterminations. Usually every year, people would have to redetermine their Medicaid to see if they were still eligible. So fast forward three years later, many people have not had to redetermine their Medicaid, and we've seen our Medicaid enrollment numbers reach almost five and a half million in the state of Florida, which is one of the highest it's ever been. So over the course of the next 12 months, uh, starting on April 1st, the Department of Children and Families has begun the process of redetermining Medicaid for current enrollees. Some, estimate, some estimates say that anywhere from 900,000 to almost one and a half million people may lose their Medicaid coverage. Half of those approximately really are no longer eligible for that Medicaid coverage. Their income has changed. Maybe their household size has gotten a little smaller as people have gotten older or aged out. And they may need to find other coverage like the health insurance marketplace or kid care or a local county plan. The other half of those individuals losing coverage, however, may still be eligible and they might need help updating their documents or understanding letters. For any of these individuals, anyone who's losing Medicaid coverage, we wanna be able to assist them and help them get to the correct program that's going to get them access to healthcare services. And earlier in the show, you gave out your number and the number to, to reach a healthcare navigator is 813-995. 7005. You can write that down and call them. It's also on our website, wmnf.org. If you just search for healthcare navigator, you should be able to find that on our website. And there's options for people who speak Spanish in Tampa Bay. Do you what do you know about the Hispanic Services Council's Pro, Promotoras de Salud, which people can call at 813-936-7700? Their website is hispanicservicescouncil.org. Do you know anything about that group and the types of services they provide to the Spanish language community? Amazing nonprofit as well. They uh, 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 community health workers, they have community health workers um, that work to assist people with understanding health insurance literacy, um, nutrition, um, healthy living activities as well. Um, and uh, community health workers are an amazing asset to our community as well. And the, uh, the, Covering Florida Navigator is kind of the whole Florida statewide uh, navigation system. Their website is coveringflorida.org, or you can call, so you can call anywhere in the state, and correct me if I've got this wrong, but I think you can call anywhere in the state to talk with the Covering Florida Navigator with, by this number, 877-813-9115. So even outside of the Tampa Bay area, that's the number that people can call. Absolutely. And on our website and on the Covering Florida website, there's an online scheduler where either one, whatever website you go to, it's going to be the same one. So you type in a zip code for Tampa Bay, you'll find navigators in Tampa Bay. You type in a zip code for Palm Beach County, you'll find navigators that cover that area too. So we're very fortunate to be a part of a large statewide consortium to have counterparts all around the state. And when you say an online schedule, there's scheduler, does that mean that you will schedule an in-person appointment or will someone contact you um, over the web? Either one, whatever the preferences of the person looking for assistance. In Hillsborough County, we have over 10 locations alone that would be able to provide in-person assistance. And then in the other counties we serve, we have um, very many, a lot as well. Um, or if people would like to have phone or virtual assistance, we can provide that option too. And if people are trying to figure out which is best for them, whether it's to, to do an online consultation or phone consulta consultation or something in person, give us an idea of some of the physical locations you have where people can meet with, with navigators so they have an idea of whether it is convenient for them or not. 
Sure. So for Family Healthcare Foundation, we're at all seven of the Children's Board Family Resource Centers in Hillsborough County. We also have two office locations in Hillsborough, an office location in Polk, and we have in-person availability in Pinellas. And then in Pasco County, we have um, our partnership with Premier Community Healthcare Group at their clinical locations. Tampa General Hospital has navigators on site at their Davis Island location. Baycare Health System has navigators at all uh, most of their hospital locations as well. Um, and then Evra Health in Pinellas County also has two navigators too. So again, 35 different navigators all around the four county area, in-person, virtual phone. We're hoping to meet as many people as possible where it's comfortable for them to be met. Our guest is Katie Roders-Turner, Executive Director of Family Healthcare Foundation. And we're talking about health insurance, especially changes to Medicaid availability. And we'd like you to call in if you have any questions, 813 239 9663, or you can email dj at wmnf.org or text 813-433-0885. I'm Sean Canan. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. We're broadcasting live from the Tampa studios of WMNF on May 9th. And I have a couple of other resources that I'm going to read about. So if let me know what you know, Katie, about these resources. So the Department of Children and Families Office of Economic Self-Sufficiency, they have a customer call center that will refer you to local resources if this is the is is the best way for you to reach out. So here's their number, the, the Department of Children and Families, 850-300-4323. If you called them, what kinds of services would you find from the Department of Children and Families? I know that they have a really great um, Hope Navigator initiative where they're hoping to connect people to services around the state of Florida. Um, they've started using Find Help previously called Aunt Bertha, to identify local resources where people live. My understanding is that they're connecting people with social, social services or other services that will help them live healthy lives, um, getting access to employment services, um, food pantries. So it seems to be a really great initiative. And the website for the Department of Children and Families also has instructional videos about the process on Medicaid redetermination. Are you familiar with those videos? Will they give people a better idea of how they can reapply or, or to find out if they're still eligible for Medicaid? And again, the website there is myflfamilies.com, where you can find these instructional videos about Medicaid redetermination. There's some wonderful resources on that website. I would also mention that there's the DCF virtual assistant as well. So we've used that with families looking to find out information about their benefits coverage. Uh, using that is a great way to not have to call in. Um, as I mentioned, call times do vary and we do have an increase in people looking to get assistance. So any ch chance that you can uh, use that DCF virtual assistant, I would highly encourage people to use it. Our guest is Katie Roters turner Executive Health Executive Director of Family Health Care Foundation. And we're talking about Medicaid and the changes to Medicaid availability that happened on April 1st in Florida and around the country. We're specifically focusing on Florida, of course, because most of our listeners and, and viewers are, are from Florida. And so we want to give people as much information as they can so that they can keep their their Medicaid or keep whatever kind of health insurance they have, or if they're uninsured or need to change insurance, that they have options for finding out how what the best way is to get medical insurance or change their medical insurance. And one of the best ways, Katie, is the number that you gave out, which is the way to call your navigators to, to talk to them, talk, and they'll talk you through the process. 813-995-7005. What is that experience like when someone calls that number? What, will, what kinds of questions will the navigators be able to answer? So our navigators will do a quick screening with every person who calls, asking a few questions that may help determine which program is going to be the best fit for them. So if someone lives in Pinellas County, we're likely not going to be talking about Hillsborough County Healthcare Plan. Um, so after just reviewing a few questions with them, the um, healthcare navigators will share what programs may be the best fit and then offer to schedule an appointment to do the application with that individual at an in-person or over the phone or virtual option. If an individual feels like they're able to complete those applications themselves, then we'll also share that information as well. Um, all of these programs and applications have publicly facing websites so that people can provide that, can complete that application on their own. So we're able to provide the one-on-one -on -one application assistance. We're able to assist with troubleshooting. We're happy to have ideas bounced off of us. Um, really, whatever is going to be the best fit for the person that's giving us a call. 
And what do we know about Medicaid? Is there any legislation nationally that's that's talking about um, changes to Medicaid or expanding eligibility to everyone in the country? Is there anything on that grand of a scale that we that, that's coming up, or what should kind of people keep an eye on if they're interested in healthcare policy at the national level? Is there is there anything that's happening, I guess, in Congress or with the uh, federal agencies about health insurance? I can say that in the state of Florida, there's some wonderful organizations that are, are working on policy changes. So uh, agencies to keep in mind, uh, Florida Voices for Health, Florida Health Justice Project, Florida Policy Institute. These are Florida agencies that are focusing on benefits for in residents of the state of Florida. Um, nationally, um, we know that uh, you know we've seen a lot of increase to the support for existing legislation for the Affordable Care Act. So we saw an expansion to navigator services, an increase in advanced premium tax credits. A lot of that was in response to COVID-19. Um, so we believe that support will be continuing at least through 2024. Um, and then after that, we are kind of just waiting and seeing what might be on the horizon. Well, Katie, before I let you go, what is there anything else that we haven't covered in this hour about health insurance and the navigator system and Medicaid changes? Is there anything else that our listeners should know or anything you'd like to say as we wrap up? Thank you. So this is not a time to panic. As we mentioned, not everyone's losing their Medicaid coverage in the month of May, but changes may be coming for Florida families. And we want to be able to be there to assist them as much as we can. And we know we can't do it alone. We've got a very, like a large um, community of people who are invested in ensuring, especially that Tampa Bay residents have access to affordable or no cost coverage. Uh, to meet with a navigator, please give us a call at 813-995-7005. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe today, Katie. Thank you for having me. Katie Roeders Turner is Executive Director of Family Health Care Foundation. And you can watch this interview on WMNF be WMNF.org beginning this afternoon. And Tuesday Cafe also airs on the television station TBAE on Tuesdays at 8 in the morning and at 2 in the afternoon. I want to thank our phone screener, John Dunn. You've been listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. I'm News and Public Affairs Director at WMNF Tampa. We'll be back next Tuesday at 10. And we're going to talk next week about a national treasure in Sarasota County called Warm Mineral Springs, a great environmental spot. During this time slot tomorrow, Shelly Reback will host Midpoint. And coming up next is Wavemakers with Janet and Tom Sherberger. They'll speak with meteorologist Dennis Phillips, who will discuss Hurricane Ian, the 2023 hurricane season prep, and the climate crisis. You are listening to Tuesday Cafe. We're coming to you live on May 9th, 2023 from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks to everyone who contributes at WMNF.org.